resources, let's get started. Welcome, everyone. My name is Peter Corliss, Director of Technical Advocacy at SillaDB. I'll be your host for today's webinar, Defining Observability in Your Cloud DBAS. Today, you will be learning about how developers and DevOps professionals can use SillaDB's observability tools in SillaDB monitoring stack to troubleshoot issues and significantly improve their performance. First, a little about SillaDB. SillaDB is a monstrously fast and scalable NoSQL distributed database perfect for highly available, highly performant terabyte scale workloads. It was patterned after Apache Cassandra and also offers an Amazon DynamoDB compatible API. Here's a quick snapshot of some of the many companies using SillaDB. As you can see, it's not just one industry. Anyone looking to run a big, fast, always on distributed database can use us. You can start small and keep scaling. There's no barriers to hit as your company or your use cases grow. Without any further ado, I have the pleasure of introducing to you our speakers today, Rauf Chebri, Developer Advocate at Silibi, and Amnon Hyman, Principal Software Engineer, and the head of the team uh, that works on SillyDB monitoring stack. Please take it away, Rauf and Amnon. Thank you, Peter. Um... Uh, hi, hello everybody. I'm Rauf Shibri. I'm a developer advocate at SillaDB, and uh, I'm very excited today to talk about uh, observability and monitoring. And uh, we'll have Amnon joining us in a second. So Amnon is our expert in um, uh, the, the monitor dashboard that we're going to see the, later. He's got more than 20 uh, years of experience, and he's also uh, uh, one of the people who knows Silla the best. So. Um, Let's go to the agenda. <clears throat> we're going to talk a little bit about the app um, that we built for you today. So it's a Twitter clone app. It doesn't do much, but we're gonna see how it actually reacts um, at scale. And then since we are in a SillaDB talk, we're going to review some of SillaDB uh, core concepts. And then we're gonna jump into the monitoring and talk about some CQL best practices. All right, so let's uh, talk about the app. I have a screenshot here, but I think it would be better just to show it to you over uh, the browser. So it's just uh, it's a it's a front end that was built with using React. It's a Twitter clone app. I basically have my um, posts here. I have authors, and I can like my 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 posts, and I can add posts here. So I I, I can add another hi, um, uh, and. Uh, uh, this app, the way it is right now, it, it's working perfectly uh, for me. Uh, I developed it. I can add my uh, post back and forth, and uh, and uh, but I'm not really stressing the app that much. So I'm using it. I'm using SillaDB as a database, but I'm not really stressing it. And we're going to see what's going to happen if I do a load test. Um, this is a this is a great scenario for us and for SillaDB is because. Um, Let's say that tomorrow you you, you want to build uh, the the same app. It doesn't have to be a Twitter clone, but imagine an app where you have um, hundreds of thousands of users, millions of users that all write at the same time, and you need uh, you, you need a database that can handle that that kind of load. Um, SillaDB could be a very good candidate for you, actually, um, and this is one of the reasons uh, uh, one of the reasons where, where we're showing you this. Um, so let me, without further ado, actually go to um, uh, go go to the slides and uh, talk a little bit about SillaDB. So I said that I, I said that we are using SillaDB in this particular scenario because it, it performs really well at scale. Um, but what is really SillaDB? So SillaDB is a distributed database. And uh, what does that mean? It means that we have multiple nodes or multiple machines that uh, that will store your data, and uh, and you, it means that your data is replicated in, in different part of your uh, data center, uh, which ensures uh, uh, which ensures uh, availability and high availability. Um, okay, so um, now to talk about um, about our application and about monitoring, I would like to invite. I would like to, to invite uh, Amnon so uh, to to join us. Hey, Rob. Hey, Amnon. How are, how are you? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I, I heard you have a new cool application. Yeah, absolutely. No, thanks for joining us. I was just talking about the application, and I think that you you, you that uh, you could be of help to see what happens actually at at scale. So 
I'm actually um, going to go to the uh, the dashboard here. So what I created is just a, a Twitter app. And I, as you can see here, I ran a load test uh, sometime this morning around uh, around eight. And uh, um, and I had about uh, 10,000 10, operation, uh, operations per second. Um, so my application actually looks good and I have um, my writes that are sub -milli uh, millisecond, but can you tell us more of, about what we can see in this dashboard and how we can, um, uh, what we can actually uh, uh, conclude from this? Okay, so you, you did well that we start with the overview dashboard that gives you an overview of the entire cluster. And we see that you have uh, three nodes in your cluster. All of them are part of the cluster. It seems fine. Your latencies are great. Even in your uh, 99 write latencies is below milliseconds, so it's great. The load here on the cluster is really low. And I think that you're not stressing the, the database enough. Mm -hmm. okay. So um, though everything seems perfect, right? Mm -hmm. um, latencies yes. are good. Um, nothing, uh, nothing is major. Maybe there are issues that we're still not uh, we're still unaware of mm -hmm. that may <clears throat> hurt us in the future when we'll face an actual load. So what I suggest is that you switch to the CQL dashboard. Right now we're on the overview. Let's switch to okay. the CQL dashboard. Okay. So the CQL dashboard and the way I have it open right there. Um, okay, I have it open right here. Um, yeah, here it is. So the upper part of the SQL dashboard shows, you know, just the normal thing that you'd expect to see on a SQL dashboard. That's like insert, uh, delete, reads, and so forth. But if you scroll just a little bit uh, down, okay, yep. all the way to the optimization part. Yes, the optimization part is a. It was something that was designed for situation just like you you're facing. Like you already have an application that is running. <clears throat> but you're still in develop, uh, development mode. So okay. you want to make sure that you're not missing anything when you're developing the issue, the, the application. So m maybe the thing that because you're not stressing the database hard enough, because Scylla is a very strong database, maybe you don't see it yet, but you are going to see that in the future. So the way the optimization section is uh, was designed, that you have all those gauges, all of them should be usually green and on zero. And what we see here that we have plenty that are not zero. So there seems like we're facing a few issues. So let, let's start to, to try to tackle them. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, and, so uh... let's start with the upper left one. Um, it seems like you forgot to prepare your statement. Would that be? Maybe we have an. Uh... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, actually, uh, I didn't prepare any of my statements. Um, uh, you're right. So if uh, if I go to the code, um, so uh, th this is a simple Node.js application uh, to, uh, to to do my load test. Um, and uh, as you can see here, uh, I'm connecting to the database using the central driver. I'm creating an instance of client, and I'm and I'm adding my, my Node data center username and password in order to connect um, to my instance of Scylla that is uh, in the cloud. Um, and uh, the other thing that I'm doing is creating this uh, options uh, object where I'm passing a different uh, different parameters to, um, uh, to, to to my query or that I want to execute. So one of the things that I can do is prepare, sorry, is write prepare and set it to true. And then I pass uh, my parameters and my, my options uh, to uh, my uh, to my to uh, uh, to to my function, and I can execute the query uh, with the parameters and the options. Then here, what I what I'm telling uh, the, the driver uh, is that my uh, query is prepared. Um, but what, can you can you tell us more maybe about what it does for us? Uh, yeah. So first, it's it's a super cool feature of Node.js. Um, it makes it so simple to prepare your statements. That's very nice. Now, when you're preparing a statement, 
um, you actually what's you know what's happening behind the scene is um, you're doing your queries in two phases. Like on the first phase, the driver tells Scylla, this is the query that I'm going to use and I'm going to use it more than once. And then mm -hmm. on the following, when it actually executes the query, it saves itself a, a lot of trouble and, and, and a lot of work. And there are a few different reasons why, why to prepare your statement. Like the first mm -hmm. one, and that's something that a lot of people are doing, um, they kind of insert the values into the query, like you know, uh, yeah. joining multiple strings and creating one big query. And, that, and that's a potential security risk. That's, a, that's how you get secure injection. So, yeah, so that's, adding, that's so the, like adding the, uh, the actual numbers in the, like in the string and then pass it to, uh, to your function. Right. Right. That, that's yeah. so first of all, you should always use uh, placeholders and never an actual values and yeah. inside your string. So that's first. Second, um, there is the, the thing that um, if you prepare a statement, then Scylla wouldn't need to uh, parse the string itself. So it saves a little bit of mm -hmm. uh, work as well. And that's important when you, you're running the same queries again and again. But mm -hmm. the most important thing is um, we've seen in, in your demonstration at the beginning that when the client sends in the information to Scylla, um, the, the query itself need to reach the, uh, the replication, the replicas. Now, if you prepare your statement, the driver can understand the parameters. That allows it to send uh, the request to a node that actually holds the data. So instead of sending it to just random node, it saves you one hope. It sends it directly to a node that they have the information and the overall result will be faster. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Yeah. So instead of sending the, the query to the wrong node, send it directly to the right node. And that's what the, uh, one of the things that prepared statement does for you. Um, in addition to uh, help you uh, for security issues and in SQL uh, injections. Right. So yeah, that's, uh, uh, yeah, cool. that's that sounds great. Um, so I'm I'm gonna go back to the dashboard here, and I can see. Um, I just wanted to to say. So what, what what I did here is, I actually went back to the exact time where this was. This is not running live. I went back to the exact time where I did my load test. Mm -hmm. um, so and what it was running the load test, I could see here 100. <laughs> percent I could see 100 percent everywhere. Not not 100, percent but it was red everywhere. Mm -hmm. So it was in the in the, the the high 90s. I just wanted to highlight that. But uh, what other problem you can uh, tell us about? Okay. So next, um, I see that you're doing some the non page one just on mm -hmm. the right. right yes. Yeah. You are doing some uh, reading, like heavy reading, and mm -hmm. you're not paging a query. Uh, okay. Yes. Could that be. Yes. Actually, there is an instance where I'm doing that, and uh, when I get my posts, so although. Uh, when I when I created posts, I created uh, hundreds of thousands or millions of posts uh, in my database. So I'm bringing only 200 here, but uh, I could always uh, page them if I want to. Um, and the way I can I can do it. So instead of using um, a client or execute to execute my query, uh, I could use, actually use um, client etro etro, and uh, it actually uses the same parameters here. So I can use query, I have my params, um, I can have my options as well. So the, the in addition, what we can have is uh, a callback function, um, a callback function that actually have, um, so uh, the rows uh, as a, a parameter, and I can, I can then um, um, do uh, the, my, uh, do whatever I want with the with, with the different rows. And one thing that I should add um, uh, to uh, to to my options is actually um, the the uh, the fetch size. I can I can have a fetch size of um, um, let's say a ten of ten here. Um, so I, what I'm what I'm going to tell. Uh, the silo driver, the Cassandra driver, or the driver, is to bring um, ten rows at a time. 
Um, and I actually have some slides for that. Um, um, and basically, well, page page queries do what you expect them to do. You basically take um, uh, take a, a, a finite uh, uh, size of data and send it to the client instead of taking the whole data and then uh, jump to the next page. But can you tell us uh, why we should use uh, page queries, uh, Amnon? Okay, so that's that's a great example. The thing is, like when Scylla sends the information to the client, it needs to store all that information in memory. And the client would need to store all that information in memory, and, and it could be a lot. Now, using page queries is always like a good practice, but it's especially important when you're reading a lot of data. So instead of, you know, if you run, and, and you know, tables in Scylla could be millions of rows easily. Yeah. So instead of storing all that in memory and send all those huge chunk of data over the network, and then the client would need to face all that memory, uh, we, we split it into pages and send only that page at a time. And that's helped, you know, all, all parties, like both Scylla and your client would, would have an easier life in this situation. Okay. Uh, great. Thanks, Anon. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to get back to the dashboard here. Uh, what else can you tell us? Um, I see that you're... Oh, I see that you have allow filtering on somewhere. Okay. And that's in, that's interesting because um, if we're looking at it, it doesn't yeah. look like you have a lot of <laughs> queries, right? You don't need to use that a lot. No. It's actually, no, it's just 100 reads. So uh, I'm not sure why that that is a problem, actually. Okay, so that's 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 an interesting situation. It's a very good example. Now, okay. allow filtering happens, as, as you know, that if you try to write a query that doesn't that filter, but not according to an actual uh, index. Mm -hmm. And in that yes. scenario, um, Scylla warns you that it might be a problem and don't do that unless you know what you're doing. And if you still want to filter not according to an index, you need to add the allow filtering to your query. Now, okay. what happens so, here, if, if actually, you can still stay at the... Um, um, oh, you want me to go back? I just want to show that what's happening on the yes. dashboard yes. is that while you don't have many queries, you just only like a hundred of them per, per second, which is nothing. And mm -hmm. um, what happens is that Scylla reads a lot and throw away most of what it reads. That's usually okay. a, a scenario when uh, Scylla needs to read the entire table or most of the entire table just to fetch the row that you're, that you're after. So basically, so basically you need to read both of these two graphs in order to understand the whole picture of what's happening. So exactly, uh, exactly. even though here we have a so, hundred here. Okay. Exactly. So you see, you don't do, you don't have a lot, but each of them cause like uh, a lot of damage because it, it means that you're reading the entire table again and again and throw away most of what you just read. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I can see, yeah, here there are uh, 300,000 reads, although here is just a hundred reads, but there are 300,000 reads that we probably don't need. So yeah. Right. Um, uh, okay, so uh, actually, I can think of an instance of that, and it's when I get the post by author. So here, I'm using a lot filtering because I want to get uh, um, I want to get post by author name, and if I go back to actually not the key space, but <clears throat> I have another file here, my SQL, just to show you the um, my my scheme here. So I have a table authors and I have a table posts in the Twitter key space. Uh, and, uh, and I am getting the post by author name, but the problem is um, author name is not one of my indexes. Actually, I have uh, author ID and timestamp as uh, primary uh, primary key. Um, so this is why I'm using a lot filtering. If you use this query by itself, uh, it doesn't work. Um, that's why you need the allow filtering. Uh, so by default, it will ask you to use one of the indexes. But if you think that for some particular case that you need to allow filtering, then you can still do it. But um, it's not the most efficient way of doing it. 
so that's why it's uh, it's flagged. Um, so one way I can um, I can fix this very simple fix for me is just to use ID instead of um, uh, author ID instead of uh, using author name, and I can have the ID. Uh, I can replace your ID and add it to my parameter and make sure that uh, I am console log it the way uh, the way it should uh, it should be. But uh, are there other ways to fix this? Uh, I'm not. Yeah, so that's that, that was actually a, a really simple fix. But there are situations when you still need to to filter uh, according to something else. <laughs> But in this mm -hmm. case, when you don't have anything, uh, you can't use the index at all because there are no relation between the ID and the name. If you mm -hmm. were still need to search by name, you can add a, a secondary index or a materialized view, and then you okay. will be able to um, to do your search by that. Let's see. Okay. Um, okay. So that, that sounds great. Yeah. Um, so let's, yeah, I'm going to, Take you back to the dashboard and uh, let's see if we have other things we want to we want to fix. What do you think? Oh, you have um, yeah. I see that you have a range scan and you're oh, not right. bypassing yeah. cache. Okay, so what that means? Um, I have slides for um, you if you want. Sorry, I have slides for you if you want. You want, you want to say you want to try that? Okay, let's yeah let's. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so when typically, typically when uh, Scylla uh, do a read, it goes to the cache and look for the information in the cache because um, because of locality. Like usually, the thing is, if you write something uh, recently or you read some something recently, it will be in the cache. The problem with range scans that they are way like you are scanning way more than your cache sizes, mm -hmm. so. There's no point in just going over the, the cache and look for the information there. It won't be there. So when you're doing like you have a, it, it's the typical case is you have a, a large table. You're looking over either the entire table, or most of the entire table, <clears throat> like a really big range. Mm -hmm. And there are two things why you should bypass the cache in those situations. First of all, first of all um, it doesn't help. Like it's um, going directly to the SS table. The SS table is the representation on the disk. So going directly to the SS table would save some time on Scylla side. That's one. The second mm -hmm. the, in the one that is even more important, that if you will try to go through the cache, you just pollute your cache. And other uh, queries, that would run in the same time would also get hurt by uh, their performance would, would be would be hurt. Mm -hmm. So, in general, if you're doing a, a large scan of a large part of your um, of your data, don't use the cache and just change the query to use the bypass cache. Um, okay. So if I go back to the code, actually, I can think of an. Uh, instance where I did that is uh, when I get authors, actually I'll get all the authors. Um, I It's a good candidate also for paging, but uh, one thing that I can do here is just bypass cache and it will do that for me. So it's a very simple fix uh, to do if you querying one table and you think you're querying all that, uh, that table all the time and, and you see it on, on the monitor. Definitely. Um, Definitely. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and yeah. by the way, that's also that if you happen to do the allow filter, which we just talked about, it's also a good candidate for bypass cache. Like if, if you are facing a situation when you query a large part of the mm. data, don't mm. try to use the cache. Wow. Yeah. That's, uh, that's interesting. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, I yeah, can okay. see that we have uh, Whoa, that we have one later. here. Okay, yeah, but we need we need to explain uh, just you know a little bit about the consistency level first, I guess, right? All right, let me let me go back to the slides and uh, yeah, we can talk about consistency level. Okay, go so ahead. we've if you remember that you you talked uh, previously about the replication factor. The replication yes. factor is the the number of times the data is replicated. Typically, mm -hmm. it's three. 
And that means that um, if, you, you if your data is replicated three times, you can still uh, lose a node and the cluster theoretically can continue to work as expected. Mm -hmm. Now, in, in a normal situation, the client sends a request to a node and that's the coordinator node. The coordinator sends it to the replica, waits for the reply, send the reply back to the client and all is well. Now, there is a question when the coordinator node gets the request from the client it needs to reply to wait for the replies from the replicate from the replicas the question is how much time the, the coordinator waits before it sends the, the reply to the client and that's not about time like in how much you know time in, in, in seconds milliseconds yeah exactly but in how many replies it gets before it enters the client and it could be anything between nothing and all so mm -hmm. on one extreme if, if continue the next on one extreme if the um uh, the rep the coordinator can get the, rep the request it can you reply immediately and do all the work in the background like it would be really quick like don't let the client wait now, the problem with that is you might lose consistency. Now, this is maybe time to understand that when we're talking about consistency level, that there are a few things that we need to take into account. First of them, the consistency. Like when you write something, you expect it to stay there, even in case of, of failure. Second is availability. When a node is down, you still want the cluster to operate. And third is reading your own write. And that means that if a client first writes and then reads, you expect that it would read what it just wrote. Now, mm -hmm. the first situation is the coordinator gets a request and immediately reply. That's called consistency level any. Mm -hmm. And this, in this situation, that you can, like in case that the coordinator will crash at that point of ta in time, the information is gone, even though the client got an okay. So consistency level any is supported because it's part of the CQL uh, protocol, but uh, it's a bad idea to use it. So don't use okay. SQL any, never. Like. So that's one extreme. The other extreme, you, you, can be, you can say something like, okay, I wanna be sure that everything is okay. And I'll ask the coordinator to wait for all the replies before it replies to the client. That's called consistency level all. It sounds like it's safe, but it's not. Mm -hmm. Because in case of a failure, like in case of a node failure, the coordinator won't be able to complete the request. And in that scenario, your cluster is not available. You hurt availability. So this is also rarely a good idea to use consistency level, although it's supported. Usually what we're uh, going to use is quorum. And quorum means that you got the majority uh, of the replicas uh, replied. In case of three, um, replication factor of three, the majority is two. So the coordinator would wait for two replies and then would uh, reply to the client that everything is fine. In this case, in case you, you've lost a node, still the cluster can, the client can still read and write, in, even in case of a failure. And so that's, so we have consistency because it's written to at least two, uh, two replicas before it's okay. We have availability because even if the third node would crash, hmm. the cluster is still um, available. Hmm. And last, if we read and write with quorum, we got the um, read after write persistency. Because if the client write and write to at least two, two uh, nodes and then read from at least two nodes, there will be at least one of the nodes that is uh, shared between those sets. So hmm. we got all. So <clears throat> don't you know, don't use either any or or all. So. Back to your code, I guess. I guess back to my code, and definitely I used one of the two, and I used all here. So um, 
uh, although like you, you said it was a, a back a back practice to you to use all i was actually uh, worried that uh, uh, that my data would be replicated in all nodes so that's why i, I, I used all uh, but we saw that uh, it's preferable to use uh, quorum in, in this case and one of the mm -hmm. things that uh, i wanted to add is um you, in, in in the when you use the driver so you pass the consistency level as uh, as an option as uh, to uh to to uh to your execution function and uh it could be uh so you can have different consistency levels with different queries um uh, here i just happen to uh, generalize it but you could have uh, i could have uh, quorum here i could have uh, any if i think is right but clearly it's not or i can have all if I think it's right, but clearly it is not. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's so... that's another good, good good point that the replication is set when you create the key space, but the consistency level is per query. Yes. So, yeah, so... that's a very good very good point. Yeah. When you create a key space, you set your replication strategy. But you also set your replication factor. So the uh, but. The consistency consistency level is going to be by 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 the query. Um, okay, um, let's let get well, back then. to the dashboard. So, uh, yeah, so we saw uh, we spoke about uh, the the pre preparing your statements, and that's very important for performance and uh, uh, paging the queries if uh, if, if necessary. And we, we talked a also about allowing filtering what I maybe sometimes it's uh, it's good to do it but even though we don't have many reads it can still have a lot of repercussions on uh, on performance as, as we can as we can uh, as we saw uh, in uh, allowing filtering reading filtering um we spoke about bypass cache and about consistency level and we said the consistency level better is better set as quorum um so uh I, I don't know, but I'm not if you have another advice to better to further optimize uh, uh, and uh, for, further optimize the CQL and uh, how we can use the dashboard better. Well, so uh, the only thing that, uh, that I think worth mentioning again is that um, a very good time to look at the optimization part is during development, mm -hmm. even during your testing, like way before you're even, you know, put your application in with uh, with users so that's um it a, a very early age uh, stage you can uh, see actual problems and yeah. hmm. um, i guess we can uh, pass it uh, to peter and see if we have uh, questions from from anyone yeah great um thanks a lot amnon uh, thank you for helping me with this the, this was great so back to you peter All right. Thank you, Amnon and Ruth. Hello again, everyone. I just want to take a moment for a quick audience poll. For a sense of scale, we'd like to understand how much data do you have under management in your own transactional data systems? Less than a terabyte, one to 50 terabytes, 50 to 100 terabytes, or uh, greater than 100 terabytes? Uh, pick the answer that best matches your current data set. Uh, and we'll leave this poll up for a bit. Uh, for you to answer. In the meantime, I'd like to welcome Ruth and Amnon to the stage for Q&A. Hi again. Hey, Hi again. okay, so it's time to hear from you, our audience. If you have questions for Amnon and Ruth, again, please use the Q&A button located at the bottom of your screen, ask questions. Also, if you have any private questions that you'd like to ask, please use the contact us form on our website at scyllodb.com. Uh, there's also a chat function there. Uh, and we've already had some questions asked during the presentation. So let's see what we already have queued up. Uh, first question then, what's the difference between a consistency level one and any? Oh, that's, uh, that's an excellent question, uh, by the way. It is confusing. Um, consistency level any means that uh, a coordinator answers immediately when it gets the request. Consistency level one means that there is a replica that already stored the data. And there are minus, like most of the time, it, it's not a big uh, difference, but there are situations that you can lose the data in consistency level any. 
Mm. And the only reason that is supported is because it's part of the protocol, but um, don't use it. Just Fair enough. Okay, so we do have another question here. Is this dashboard available for Scylla DB Cloud users? Well, again, a great question. It is. And you should, if, if you're a cloud user, then uh, uh, you got, uh, we make sure, you know, our cloud team make sure that you're already get, uh, getting the, like the latest dashboards, the, everything is super up to date. And you should definitely check the dashboards on your cloud. And, mm -hmm. and even more than that, uh, what Roof showed us, this is a cloud, right? It's yeah, that, that's exactly what I wanted to, to, to say. Yeah, actually, uh, so if you go to scyllaDB.com uh, slash cloud, uh, you can access the free trial. You can create your own cluster. Once you do that, you can go to the monitoring to the uh, yeah to the monitoring tab, and you will have access to exactly the same dashboard that we saw during the presentation. So I highly encourage you to do that. Uh, try to test it out, uh, play with it. Uh, it's a lot of fun, and then see how you can optimize your code. Yeah, and I believe there's even an optional feature for people who uh, use Prometheus. Let's say we can actually export metrics from Scylla Cloud for Prometheus uh, format. So so you have an option of either using the built-in tool or using your own observability systems. Uh, in fact, speaking about that, we have another question here. I'm already running Grafana and Prometheus. Can I install and run your monitoring stack in that, or do I need a separate setup? Okay, that's also a question that we get uh, we get asked a lot. And definitely, you don't need to use our own. Um, by the way, we are using a, like the default installation is uh, based on containers, and you definitely don't need to use our. Um, just make sure that as, as long as you're pretty much uh, using uh, like a, a latest, not necessarily the latest, but one of the latest uh, releases of Grafana and Prometheus, just take our dashboards and they're there and put it, them on, on Grafana and you're fine. And there's actually a documentation, part of the documentation of the monitoring explains how to do that. Mm, great. So yeah, if you don't, you don't like our installation, use your own. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, somebody else is asking, I saw there's a setting of quorum and local quorum. What's the difference? Okay, that's also, yeah, so that's um, that's um, relates to when you're using multiple data centers. Mm. If you're using more than one data center, we want to make sure that there's a, as little as possible traffic between data centers. So quorum means that when the um, when you're sending a query, it's like a quorum over the entire da uh, database. And when you're looking for a local quorum, your first, your, your client would connect to a, a local, your, the, like the closest data center, but second, it also would get a quorum in that data center. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's both performance, but also uh, we, we need to remember that traffic is expensive between data centers, especially, you know, when you're running in a cloud, and it's different, you know, continents or something like that. So yeah, yeah, yeah that that could save a heck of a lot. Um, and yeah. so then uh, I have another question here: uh, Can the coordinator node be one of the replicas? Somebody was paying close attention to your slides there. Uh, that's uh, <laughs> that's also yeah. <laughs> Actually, we expect it to be okay. So the um, in the slides we, we they kind of broke that into two parts: that you have a coordinator node mm -hmm. that could be any node. Mm -hmm. And uh, replica, uh, and, and then the replicas are other nodes. But if you are, if you're um, prepared your statement correctly, and if you are using the driver, like a Cassandra driver, or preferably our own driver, the driver would would pick up a coordinator that is also a replica, and that saves a lot because um, the the, there are, the coordinator would know it's like already know have the information. And if let's say that we're talking about a replication factor of three and and like another um, and th then you need like you just need another answer before it answers to the client. So all in all, it saves a lot. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So yeah, th definitely a reason why to use uh, a Cassandra driver or, or even better our own other web drivers. Yeah, you know the other thing too is that there's some people have really complex questions. So uh, I just want to recommend for people, again, I've already said that if you want to ask a private question, you can do contact us on our website. Um, why don't you talk also about our Slack channel? Uh, and I think you also answer some questions there, don't you? 
Sorry? The Slack channel. Um, do you want to mention anything about our Slack channel then? Oh, yeah, that's definitely. Yeah. Um, we, 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 so again, if you have other questions right, right now or um, anything that is, can be um, that can be shared publicly, just you know, throw throw a question on the, the Slack channel. There's someone who pick that up and answers. Uh, if it's something that you don't want to share publicly, you can you know reach us directly, and we're happy to answer exactly. if you can. And then the other thing I would just want to remind the audience is that we do have the uh, live workshop next week. So th that's supposed to be a very interactive session. Uh, so if you have any questions about this kind of stuff that you want to ask in depth, it's a great opportunity to have some engineering FaceTime. Um, you know, so, so definitely check right on sillytobe.com slash webinars, and you'll have that opportunity to, to attend uh, a, a, a working uh, session next week. All right, anything else that you guys wanted to cover? I'm good. Fair Ooh. enough. I wanted yeah. to thank both of you. Uh, I learned a heck of a lot by listening to you, and I hope our audience has as well. Uh, in fact, I want to thank our audience very much for attending today. In due time, you will find this presentation available at the SillaDB.com homepage uh, in our webinar section for on-demand viewing. Also remember to register for that workshop, uh, workshop next week. And for now, on behalf of Amnon, Ruv, and myself, and all of us at SillaDB, Enjoy the rest of your day.